Tennessee Wildcast is live on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. Uh, glad to be here at Ames Plantation today. Uh, right out in front of the mansion, uh, great location for <laughs> manor house. the manor house. I'm sorry, <laughs> the Ames Plantation, Ames Manor House. Uh, but excited to be here. We're going to be talking about ticks today, and I've got Amy here as my co-host. Thanks for being with us today. Amy. No problem. Uh, she lined this show up, and uh, today we're going to be talking with Dr. Alan Houston here at the Ames Plantation, and uh, it should be a fun show. Well, I don't know if it's fun when you're going to be learning about ticks. Well, I mean, it's going to be it's interesting. educational. Yeah, guys. education. And uh, uh, we're going to hear a little bit about this property, I hope. Well, I'm, I might put well, what's on going spot. on here? What's anywhere? going on here? And, and kind of look, you know, a little bit of background about this place. But uh, so anyway. All right, Dr. Houston. Got a lot to talk I'm about. I'm going to ask you a real tough question right off the bat. Okay. What is your title here at Ames? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I am a professor with the University of Tennessee. Department of Forestry, Wildlife, and Fisheries in Knoxville. I'm also uh, a leader of uh, the research uh, and management for the uh, forest and wildlife here on Ames. Well, one thing I've always known about Ames is the research, and y'all have been doing a ton of research in a variety of things, as we were talking earlier, everything except snakes and... Uh, uh, snakes and uh, turkeys, I Turkeys think. are the only things that you've not done research on here at Ames, but the one thing that's been going on here recently has been some tick research. Yes, tick research. Uh, I got concerned, uh, now first of all, I'm not the expert, uh, but I, as an ecologist, I got concerned about a couple of things, and one is this, is that people were, they were coming to me and telling me I had Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but they weren't sick enough, they had not been sick enough, and I got suspicious that there's something out there that's mimicking it, and so we began to try to do some research, of the way you can do some of this and do it well is to start and then the experts in Knoxville will say, that idiot Houston's getting ready to mess it up. <laughs> and so they'll come down and begin to, uh, to do that. And the uh, expert, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Becky Trout Frixel, came down and uh, began to partner with this. And she's really the leader. A lot of what I'm going to tell you I've learned from her. But, of course, a lot also is just the experience of what we've done over the last several years. Okay. Let's, uh, i got a picture here of Becky. Is it her in the blue? It is. She's kneeling, and then she has two of her graduate students there, uh, Sarah Mays and Brian Hendricks, and they did two separate uh, projects that lasted a couple of years between them. Okay. Well, she's, so she's the expert and the brains behind the research then. Unfortunately, she is the brains of the expert. I'm just the gopher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure they appreciate you bringing it to their attention and, and providing a place to do this research. And, and it's a great place to do research because it's so large and it's so varied. Uh, with all the different kinds of habitats, and we pulled in other experts as well, but Becky deserves a lot of credit for what we found. For the ones that don't know, just real quick, how many acres is Ames Plantation? So when people think, well, we've got a large area, some people are thinking, oh, probably, what, 1,500, 2,000 acres. No, it is exactly... 18,400 acres. Yes, that is a big area to do research. It's a chunk of ground. And, and it a, is yeah. continuous, which it, is very unique anymore. It is all together, and it goes everywhere from a river bottom up to some of the driest hills. So if, you, if you're looking for something to do and you want a background, that is, I need an upland, I need a river, I need something, well, generally Ames has it. Yes. And tell us real quick, you were telling us earlier that this place started out how many acres when they first bought the property? Mr. Ames bought the house and bought the property 400 acres. 400. And then he was interested in cattle and the bird dogs, and he just began to expand until he had 25,000. And when he passed away, Ms. Ames set it up, and she sold land to support the foundation and 18,000. 600 acres, and then it's changed up and down a little over time. And one of the oldest cattle herds, Angus cattle herds, right? He got interested in cattle, brought them over, and we have the third oldest registered uh, Angus herd in the nation and the, and the oldest in Tennessee. Awesome. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderland, really, if you think about it, for the outdoors. It is. It is. All right, well, let's get back into this ticks All right, let's jump stuff. into the ticks. Yeah. So we talk about ticks. It seems like it's in the news more and more, and everybody kind of starts paying attention to ticks and to tick diseases. So... Well, they should pay attention. And, and part of that, I think, a couple of things. But one is the Lone Star Tick. Uh, we started seeing those populations a number of years ago, and, uh, and they've just gone straight up. You know, it used to be less, and, and, and your sportsmen out there will, I think, uh, uh, relate to this. What, 15 years ago, if you went out and you got a tick bite, you talked about it all summer. 
Now if you go out and you don't get a, uh, a tick on you, you talk about it all summer in a way. And part of that is because of the Lone Star. Those populations moved in and went straight up. Yeah, the other morning, uh, got back to the house. I wasn't covered, but my husband was covered. And I said, you should spread a little bit better. Well, you know, <laughs> and I really believe this. Some people, they don't, the ticks are, uh, I have a friend, and he can sit beside me. And it looks like a, a caribou migration coming across him to get to me. <laughs> uh, so some people, they just don't bother. Some people, they just. I'm that way with chiggers. There you go. If there's one in a two-mile radius, it's on me. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so diseases. What does what diseases do these? Well, ticks actually, carry? I, yeah, yeah. What does it? Yeah. All right, diseases. There's a there's a lot of diseases. There are bacterial diseases like Lyme disease or lichiosis. Um, uh, it's called Starry, the the southern tick associated rash illnesses. There are viral diseases, and some of those are very dangerous. There are protozoan. There are even neurotoxins. Uh, you could have a tick on you tonight, get up in the morning, and not be able to move a muscle. Mm. Uh, I heard recently of two kids that came on two different weeks uh, down to the hospital in uh, Memphis, Children's Hospital. Couldn't move. They, they were in bad shape, and the doctors did not know what was going on. They finally found a tick within six hours. The first child was okay. Uh, two weeks later, another child, similar circumstances. They knew what to look for now, for the tick, and the child was okay. Now, these kids were in circumstances that were uh, dire. And the doctor said, I haven't seen this in 20 years practicing here, and I've seen it twice in two weeks. So neurotoxins. And then uh, also the meat allergy, the, uh, the alpha-gal, which is a, a that's, sugar. That's the one that scares me. Well, it ought to. Um, I, I had not heard of it, oh, let's just say five or six years ago. And now I hear about it more and more and more and more. Uh, on Ames Plantation, we have three people with it, including a young lady that is has severe, very quick reactions with only the, the smallest amount of exposure. So, you know, many of these diseases, uh, even Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, is dangerous as it is, and it is really, truly dangerous if you let it get away. Mm. Um, we can be treated and get over that. And... Lyme disease, if it's caught early enough, we can be treated and get over that. I, yeah. I had Lyme. Meat allergies. Came in school 15 years ago. There you go. In Kentucky. So. Meat allergies forever. Oh, well, no, let me back up. So far as is known, uh, there are some indications that people can get over it in time if they don't get tick bit. I've heard if they're younger, they have a chance of getting over it. I, one of the officers, his son has it, and they were talking about it the other day, but I'd not heard that. Um, everybody that I know, and I have, we have six acquaintances, personal friends of ours that have it, and uh, they all say it's for life. So, I'm, I'm, you know, that's one I, I guess I need to do some more research on. Well, it, you know, it'll come out in time, do more research. I've even heard, read a paper yesterday that uh, uh, B and AB uh, blood types are less likely to get it. Mm. So, you know, if a sportsman's out there and you've got that blood type, I would just say don't count on it. Uh, uh, is this a is this a red meat only allergy or is it? Chicken or red meat only. Can't eat anything from a from a red, uh, rat to a whale. So <laughs> okay. if you're going right. to chow down on um, a good old beef burger, not going to happen. Or pork. I heard anything on hoof is what I heard. Well, that's true. Anything on hoof. Okay. Uh, Fish and chicken is pretty much their only safe thing to eat. Well, it's such a sneak too. You go and get a, a, a pizza. You get the cheese. Everybody else gets the pepperoni, and there's a tiny little piece of pepperoni on there, and then, and then you're having a reaction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Most of the ones I know carry EpiPens, and you know, yeah, that's the one that that's. And maybe eat a lot at home. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they do. So Actually, they do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's tough. Um, yeah, I don't want that either. All right, so let's jump on something else. Um, is there a time of year that carries more of a threat? The, the time of year that carries more of a threat is when the ticks are most active. And here they're active all year round if it's warm enough. Uh, but usually starting about now, April, and then all the way into September, is when the diseases are reported. Mm -hmm. For you know, They go okay. up, they go down. Um, and, and that's just a function of, of when the ticks are out there. However, I have seen ticks active at 22 degrees wow. in my truck. Uh, sitting there in a nice warm truck and found, well, here comes one down the back of the seat. So, I remember one year, the day after Christmas, we were working the dummy deer, and I was laying on the deer, and I got into the ticks. And it was the day after Christmas. And mm. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Wow. And that can be the... Of course, uh, no spray. That can be the deer tick. 
they're more active in the winter. That and was 15 years ago, so I don't remember which one was. <laughs> well, I had a bunch of them. And those are the ones that carry Lyme. Uh, not every tick carries every disease. And and we've got some pictures. Um, yeah. The slide right there that you have up, uh -huh. which tick is that? Uh, that is just the good old dog tick. Now, uh, it kind of brings you, and we'll talk about in a minute, how you catch ticks. And that particular tick is on a little cooler that mm -hmm. we use to catch them. Yeah, and then there's, there's other shots here. We've shown this one, but if you want to jump to how we catch them, or we can do that since we got some shots here and we're kind of talking about it. But how do they how do they capture these and and to do the research? Well, you, of course, you've got to have the tick. And uh, when we do have the tick, we would carry them to Knoxville, and then the tick would be ground in half. They would save half, the other half grind up, do uh, genetic sequencing. And you're not looking for various parts of the tick. You're looking for various parts of the disease. And a really happy thought is is that some of the ticks were carrying two diseases. So that's oh, well. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a wow. All right, how to catch them. You sort of play off of the way the tick acquire, acquires a host. One is the questing behavior. They would get on the end of a piece of grass, and they would quest. And when someone walks by, boop, they get a hold of him. And now he's in business. The other is they actually seek. And... Um, that, the first is passive, the more aggressive, and an and individual tick may utilize both on a given day. But, uh, so we're sitting here, we're giving off the pheromones and the carbon dioxide, the, the tick picks this up and here he comes. Now, so how do you play off that? The questing ticks, we get a piece of cloth, it's, uh, it, it's got a nap to it so the ticks can attach pretty well. Put a dowel rod there, drag it behind you for oh, th uh, 90 seconds and then pick it up and look at it and, and pick the ticks off and put them in uh, ethanol. Hmm. Then uh, the other is to get the little blue coolers, and you see them at Walmart and other places. We drill holes in them. We put dry ice in them. We have a cloth. We put that uh, cooler down there. The dry ice doesn't melt. It sublimates. It goes from the solid directly to the gas, and so uh, the carbon dioxide goes out of the tick. Ah, yep, there we are. There's supper. Comes over the next day, you can find them on the jug or on the cloth. Now, sometimes you find nothing. However, we have one spot over on names, one of our trapping uh, spots, and we came back one night and picked 1,100 off of it. <gasps> wow. That's not a good place to camp. Mm. Wow. Man. Well, you can tell me that one off, off, <laughs> <laughs> off camera. <laughs> oh, <coughs> Gives wow. you the willies. Yeah. I think we had a, we've got some more pictures of some yeah. of the research. We've got, y'all do also, you do some small mammal trapping too, don't you? Yeah, we did do that because, you know, the diseases are, are in the ticks, but it has, there has to be a reservoir out there for them. And it can be in the deer, it can be in the mice particularly. So we want to know that. Uh, so we put together a very large uh, research project and we caught mice. We searched them for uh, the uh, ticks, and uh, that was primarily with Dr. Kennedy down at the University of Memphis. But at the same time, another piece of research that we did, we wanted to know where's the most likely place to pick these up. And uh, we looked at grass habitats, we looked at pine habitats, and we looked at hardwood habitats. And what we found is it's, you can't predict. Uh, Ticks are very sensitive to moisture regimes, and so if they start to dehydrate, they'll run off into the duff, and they'll move up and down the vegetation all day. So grass, pine, hardwoods, you're, you're just flipping a coin. You can predict you're not safe anywhere. No. But <laughs> yeah. what you can predict is where they're sort of not going to be. You know, they're not going to be in a Walmart parking lot. It's just too dry. Typically not in a lawn, although they can be they, there. You, you, yeah. Sure. As much rain as we've had, maybe. Yeah, wherever it's hard for them to uh, 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 to take care of that moisture regime where they don't dry out. But no, a tick can be anywhere at any time. Then we also looked at birds. Uh, there are diseases off the coast, and uh, I'm afraid there will be here eventually. Heart water's one. A way for them to get here would be the little neotropicals. So with Dr. Michael Collins down at um, uh, Rhodes, put up mist uh, nets in these habitats, caught the birds, searching for ticks, and turned them loose. Oh, we caught 600 and some odd birds and found three ticks. Now, that's not much mm -hmm. until you understand how many birds there are there in the world. So mm -hmm. uh, a tick could catch a ride up here on a bird. Pretty easily. Pretty easy. Yeah. Well, let's, i got one more picture here, or maybe a few more, but what's, the, what's this guy doing here 
with the, it's like a camera or some kind of I tripod? He's got a camera and it's got a wide lens on it. He's shining straight up. And what that'll give you is an index of how heavy the cover is like for the timber. Is it shady? Is it not shady? Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of different factors to this research, not just oh, catching them. And, yeah, and lots of data points. That's Dr. Moore down at Christian Brothers. And you got to know the, the area you're working in and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, he's in the grassland right there with a student. And uh, you can see Dr. Kennedy. Yeah, there you go. Dr. Moore with a student. They've got a... Uh, line across there, and then every few feet, they would uh, they would really quantify what's out there. Now, the are these are these guys afraid of getting a tick on them? I was gonna I say, mean, what? How do they keep the ticks off them? Since they're the ones out there doing the research. I'd be like, uh, y'all go do that. I'll be. There's there. there's <laughs> certain things you blouse your pants. No, and, it's it's uh, that yes, uh, we. Well, that kind of takes you up for your sportsman. What are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> for us that were out in the woods, what do we do? Well, you armor up. Mm -hmm. You you make the tick work. Uh, there are four species that will accept a human. Uh, the rest of them think we're too nasty, I think. But uh, you have the Lone Star, you've got the dog tick, you've got the Gulf Coast tick, which we found here just not too long ago, and then you have the deer tick, and primarily in the winter. But the, uh, the Lone Stars, I don't, I, you know, aggressive is not quite the word, but they're not searching real estate. They're looking for a place to put down a well right now. Mm -hmm. So they're going to bite. So how do you armor up? Uh, you spray. And permethrin is probably the best product that I have found. You don't spray it on your skin. But clothes you only. On your, <laughs> on your clothes. <laughs> Experience there. Yes. <laughs> and you sp well, I'll tell you what I do for turkey hunting. I take my garb and put it on the fence, and I spray it until it's damp. I turn it inside out. I spray it till it's damp. Uh, I will wear, if it's not too awful terribly hot, very, very light long underwear with socks over the top. I will wear it top and bottom. Uh, that's been treated for uh, ticks. I'll spray my hat. I'll spray my vest. I don't spray my gun. But uh, these guys would do the same thing. And you just think about, what's a tick looking for? He's looking for skin. A shirt like this is not so good. They walk right in. Um, keep it tucked. Make the ticks work for it. And there are, there are three stages for every tick. Uh, when they're first hatched out, these are the little seed ticks. And all four of those species have that. Mm -hmm. Well, those little rascals, you can walk through a larval mass. Oh, yes, and then there it looks like thousands are just swarming up you. Been they, there? Mm -hmm. I've done that once before they, as well. Yeah, they hit like pepper, and then mm -hmm. they just spread, go through mm -hmm. your clothes and bite, and you think you've had scary. chiggers. <laughs> now, they could be dangerous if there's a vertical transmission uh, from mama to, uh, to the babes, and perhaps in some diseases there are. But you're their first meal, so you're probably, other than the fact you're going to itch yourself to death, scratch with a chainsaw. <laughs> And then um, if they get a meal fall off, they've had a chance to be uh, exposed to that vector out there, uh, mm -hmm. to that, uh, that pool of diseases. They come back as a nymph. Now, they're, uh, they're larger. They're likely to have a disease, and, uh, and, but they're hard to find. Now they get another meal drop off. Now they've had two meals. They're even more likely to have a disease, but they're bigger. So yeah, it's kind of a counterplay. So that brings us into, so do all the life stages have the diseases they don't then? No. Uh, yeah, I say no. Let's just say that the nymphs and the adults have had a pretty good chance to pick one up. And as I said, some can carry two. Okay. All right. Um, I guess the one thing I do, you know, you talk about you never spray your skin. I will spray with off. I pull up my shirt and I spray my belly. I also pull up my pants legs and I spray my legs. And I will also spray around my wrist because I don't want things crawling. And for all of us that are females in the outdoors, we have to drop our pants to go to the bathroom <laughs> where you all don't have to. So we have a chance of picking up ticks in other locations. So I'm always spraying my waist area. Well, it can't hurt uh, to spray and make them walk through a minefield. Yeah. I, I'm like, and then I, I, I used probably a half a can the other day. I was like, what are you doing? Who, who didn't um, have ticks? I'm not getting a tick. I didn't yeah. have a tick. Mm -hmm. I was good. I can't stress avoidance uh, enough. Uh, it's it's not exactly it is it's up to us and I you know I have uh, I search when I get home I have my wife look you know has yeah. uh, but ticks are not inhibited on where they get uh, I had a friend who had uh, just happened to keep that ophthalmologist uh, appointment um, he, uh, he was going to cancel but he did he said he was sitting in the chair and his doctor gave a mm. that wasn't a good mm. yeah no. So he said, what's, what's that oom about? And he said, well, you have a tick under your eyelid. Oh, wow. And my husband had one last year in his ear. 
hmm. when he went to the doctor and she went to look in and she's like, oh. And of course, she had to take, oh, you know, long four steps and get it out. Of course, he said it was brain surgery or something. Yeah. So that's <laughs> <So> why he, <laughs> he's like, how would you like four steps going in your ear? But well, that brings a good yeah. point up of how to get them out. And people, all kinds of stuff, everything from soap suds to a battery acid shock. And I've used the little thing where you spin them, and, uh-uh. and I don't like that. Mm. If, if they're Just well attached. Tweezers. Yeah. Well, if they're well attached, you're not going to get them out with these methods. Get uh, yeah. Back them out, don't you? The way to get them out is to get tweezers or something and get them around the head. Uh, you think about it, you grab them by the body. You're yeah, just, break. Yeah. What, well, you just squirt you, it back in there. Exactly. <laughs> you're just you're just, oh, wow, yeah. yeah. Mm. So you want to pick them up and, and then work them out. And then if they're really well embedded, there'll be some mouth parts in there. You need to dig those out too. So... Uh, if they're well, and sometimes the little nymphs will get half of their bodies embedded. Yeah, like they're, like they're always, almost all the way buried up in there. Yeah, just their hind end stuck out. Uh, and that's how uh, they have to do, they're so small, they have to get through the skin to get in there and feed. So, yeah, you got to be careful how you get them out. So, what do we need to do to avoid ticks when well, we're out there? I like, mean, you know, everything. Just Well, first off, spray. Okay. The second is to tuck. Try to make it where they've got to travel a long way across those minefields. And uh, I think that's the, there's the vigilance part of it, too. When you get back home, uh, look. Don't let a tick stay on long. Some of the diseases can transmit pretty quickly. Uh, some of the diseases, uh, they have to be on for a day or so. Um, also, be vigilant. Let's just suppose that someone comes to your house today that's been in, name the country, uh, Wisconsin. And uh, they're coming down to visit, and they're a hunter, they're a fisherman, and they come in and they throw uh, their hunting duds over in your corner. Now, you may have ticks. When you come in during the course, and I'll do this. You know, if I've been working outside, uh, I'll come in and take my clothes off and throw them in the dryer. Uh, that's, yeah, we, we drop them in the washer immediately and just hit wash and then goes in the dryer. Wash, it, you gotta, yeah, dryer. Wash, you wind up with a clean tick. But if you uh, then we dry them. <laughs> if you dry, <laughs> we dry that tick. The rim of the desiccating thing, you know, they're in there going, oh, I'm dried out, and that yeah. that gets them. Uh-huh. But uh, you got to be careful. Uh, if tricks have a pretty good vector, us, we can move them around all over the country in hours. Gosh, and not know it. <laughs> well, knowing. you know, a lot of times um, when I first come in, I might just kind of shake them off, and I know it's at the back door, but I, I still don't want to bring those into the house because. I have in the past had those thousands in my house before where one of us unknowingly brought them in on clothing and then the next morning wake up and they literally with the clothes that were dropped by the bed, thousands of ticks. Well, you can have the female. Everywhere in your bed. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. All that stuff goes in yes. the dryer. Because I, right, but I no, mean, goes out know, of the house. But sometimes you don't think of it if you know you've been out and you just come in and you just you know. Well, the female is the only one that swells time. up. You know, she's the one that. Sorry. Yeah. She's the one that does. Well, this. you know what happens all sometimes. <laughs> Tell me about it. Anyway. I've been uh, pregnant. <laughs> well, at least she's pregnant. Uh, so you could bring her in, and she could hatch right there in your house. Yeah, see, that's, that's an attractive scary. thought. That's, yeah. that's what you want to think about at night. Mm. Who, I mean, ne- who needs Pet Cemetery this weekend? We can I'm, just think about ticks hatching in here. I'm itching right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's something that's hatched, like we said earlier. Something yeah, there, there is something flying around. So if you uh, see us, you know, kind of itching. It's not ticks. On any but what have, y'all, what have you learned from your research here at Ticks? Well, during the course of the study, even the first year with Brian, uh, we caught 50,000 ticks. One of the things that we learned, going back to that original thought in my head, is what's mimicking? Is there anything mimicking Rocky Mountain spotted fever? Okay. Rocky Mountain spotted fever caused by bacteria. Scientific name, Rickettsia, Rickettsia. That's the four-wheel drive. Uh, that's, the, that's the bad one. Mm. However, we discovered Rickettsia parkeri. It is a lesser version. Now, so... If you got that, you would feel bad. You would, uh, you might get sick a little. You go to the doctor and you, and then get treated with doxycycline usually, and you get over it. You would have anyway. Uh, I can remember sitting right out of the parking lot, 95 degrees, with my heater going wide open because I had the chills, been exposed to ticks. Mm. Went to the doctor. Rickettsia is what they told me, which means, oh well, that's Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We will treat you. No, it was Rickettsia parkeri, I think. But now, on the other hand, we don't know the difference when we start getting sick. 
So the thing to do is indeed, if you've been exposed to a tick, you have some real concerns, then of course you go to the doctor. What else did we learn? We found the Parker rhyme. We found uh, that some of these ticks are carrying more than one disease. We did some studies trying to figure out, you know, what, um, what about the habitat types? Well, that didn't turn out for us. We checked some novel kinds of uh, ways to catch them. That cloth that we dragged behind them, mm -hmm. we impregnated it with carbon dioxide. And what we found is, is that, uh, is that uh, ticks are about as beaver. Uh, beaver, you never really beat them. Mm. Uh, they're always waiting. Yeah. Ticks, you never really beat them. You just have to be alert. I do want to go to the one slide before we run out of time here of a deer because, um, you know, we all think about ticks on us, but I've always said, how does the wildlife survive? Because if you think about them and you think about us in the woods, you know they're eat up. And uh, tell us a little bit about this. This is a fawn that you're looking at on the screen right here, and these are ticks right here in, in the, the pre-orbital pre -orbital in mm -hmm. front of the eye. Right. And, and it's just completely full of ticks. Yes, and I, I worry about wildlife too, and, and not just from a disease point of view, but, but, but that little guy's job in life is to be still and not be found. So if you've got ticks on you and you're doing the kind of things we would do or just be worried to death, that probably uh, increases its chances of a coyote uh, seeing it. And, and it kind of brings me to the thought too of what's coming that's bad. Yep, yeah, I was getting ready to say that. Where are we headed with all of this? Well, mm -hmm. not in good places. Right. Um, uh, the deer population is just a big sack of blood walking out there for a tick, so it's a wonderful host. That's one reason I think our population, well, I'm pretty sure that's a reason our tick populations went up because you've got a, a very available and, uh, and a host that's got a lot of what you want. Mm -hmm. But what's coming? Uh, the longhorn tick. I don't think it's here yet. But when it gets here, uh, they load up on, on, they can kill calves. Wow. But the really good news is, is that the female doesn't even need a male to reproduce. Oh, that's just great. <laughs> parthenogenesis. So there's no dating, holding hands. It's just. We're just having babies. Yeah, boom. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't think about that. Cattle, too. I mean, that, that's, okay. a, that's a large host. Oh, we get them well. off our horses yeah. all the time. Well, and, and usually... So and your dogs. All of y'all yeah, that dogs, have bird definitely, dogs. Definitely. Ticks are becoming one of the number one problems that we're seeing, especially in these the bird dogs here competing and your labs. I mean, they are... Uh, that's 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 a whole other subject with the veterinarian on uh, on that because uh, we just recently had some dogs with some tick-borne diseases. Wow. So Another off the coast is heart water. It's not here. Not it's here. It's coming. Yeah, tell your audience it's not here yet. It's not uh, But uh, kills cattle goats 100% of the time. I found a, a paper, finally, uh, that uh, talked about a study done in Norway with deer, killed them 100% of the time. Jeez. Well, boy, so, things to look forward to. Wow. Yeah, poor old deer are taking it on the chin, aren't they? Yeah. Well, Dr. Houston, we greatly appreciate your yes, time this we morning. We it. greatly appreciate being on the wonderful Ames Plantation. I you, love it. You are welcome. <laughs> it's a beautiful place, and uh, I know the topic was not the greatest today, but it's good information, educational. Uh, and some names of some ticks for people to go up, yeah. do some research on. Get, get that spray. Yes. Think about some of those tips that Dr. Allen uh, Houston gave us and, uh, and uh, be prepared when you go outside. That's true. So. Constant vigilance. Yes. yes. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Tennessee Wildcast. Thanks for tuning in. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week.